Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Here's your coach, Brian Buffini. Well, the top of the morning to you and welcome to the Brian Buffini Show. Very special guest with me in studio today. His name is Kyle Wilson and Kyle and I have been friends for over 20 years. Uh, Kyle, I first met as he was Jim Rohn's manager. And you guys all know if you've been listening to this show for any length of time, how huge an impact Jim Rohn had on my life. But Kyle is a heck of a lot more than just Jim Rohn's manager. Kyle worked with people like Og Mandino, the greatest salesman in the world. Brian Tracy, Les Brown, Darren Hardy, Robin Sharma. I like to refer to Kyle as the, he's the, the wizard behind the curtain. And uh, a, a, a brilliant guy, brilliant promoter, great business mind, strategic thinker, who helped some of the foremost speakers and presenters of the last 30 to 40 years, uh, not only produce best-selling books, but get their messages out and in many cases, built a business for people who didn't have a business. So, Kyle, it is a treat to see you here in live in the studio. Brian, such an honor. And, hey, I love the opening music. That was pretty cool. That's, that's our of, own music. Uh, kind of bobbing my head there. Our producer, David Lally, and his band, uh, Brogue Wave. That's oh, really? original music. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. what we do. Nice. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a very popular song on iTunes these days. That's all we got to say. <laughs> Anywho, uh, I want to dive in here again. I, I know we know each other very well. People always go, oh, you're Jim Rohn's manager. You're Jim Rohn's manager. And that for many people, that's what defines you. But that's kind of like a fingernail as a person. Um, I'd like to give folks a little bit of the background here before we dive into some of that stuff. Sure. Um, talk about where you're from and what life was like growing up in the Wilson family. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a small town, Vernon, Texas, never went to college, and uh, really good parents. I was the youngest of four by a lot. Uh, I probably wasn't planned. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I remember actually um, insecurity and fear and not knowing where the world was going to go. And I got into drugs pretty early mm. and pretty seriously, too. Mm. You know, I won't go into the depth of it. But at age 19, had a significant emotional experience, really changed my life, got serious. And uh, little did I know that would lead me to eventually meeting Jim Rohn and launching Jim Rohn International and some other things. But um, I was very blessed. I, my parents were great. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a lot of independence, mm -hmm. being the youngest sure. by a lot. Uh -huh. And now, you know, I'm, uh, this older age, I can so appreciate some of the things my parents were probably going through. How, how did you turn it around? How, how did you get out of the deep hole you were in? Yeah, I was, it was pretty bad. And so uh, my parents invited me to church, mm -hmm. you know, at age 19. And yeah, I, I had that, that emotional uh, significant experience that Great. changed my life. Good. God got a hold of you. He did. But you know what? It's uh, I always say when God gets a hold of the bad guys, bad guys make for <laughs> great good guys, you know? And yeah. uh, so that is that's awesome. So how in the world? OK, so. All right. I'm on drugs. I meet God. What's the next step on the journey here to meet in Jim Rohn? What, what's what's the gap there? No, uh, I had always been industrious. I'd always mm -hmm. had that entrepreneurial spirit. Okay. You know, you probably did things like this. Go sell things to the neighbors. Yeah had a garden and, you know, so I was always trying to make a buck and it probably extended my drug career too, because I was selling <laughs> drugs. But at age 19, I started a uh, small town. I started a little detail shop washing cars okay. and that eventually turned into a service station, which eventually turned into Wilson's Texaco on the highway and 10 employees and open 24 seven America station. So the entrepreneurial thing came out of me and mm. at age 26, I had a God whisper and it was like, you need to move and uh, to a bigger city. And I was, this my town I was in was 11,000. And I always say, you got to listen to those whispers, right? Mm. And uh, I moved to Dallas. I sold my house, sold my business, moved to Dallas, didn't know anyone. And 
I really did not have a plan. Mm. I didn't have a job lined up. I was just going to be an entrepreneur. I was overconfident. Mm. Ignorance. Jim Rohn talks yeah. about ignorance and arrogance. Yeah. That was me. I was very ignorant and arrogant yeah. that oh, I could just go make it. And uh, a year after I moved, serendipitously, I went to a seminar. And the guy putting on the seminar was looking to hire people. Uh, what he was looking for, someone that could make 100 cold calls a day. Back in the day. To, to, yeah, yeah, to then go speak at companies, to give a presentation, to then sell tickets to a seminar. The 100 cold calls a day, that was challenging. But the thought of speaking was terrifying. I just had no background that was way outside my comfort zone. But again, back to this, I felt like I was in a bubble. Oh. And I, I did it. And because I did do the numbers, I did do what, exactly what he said to do. I became his top guy. And after becoming the top guy in the country, uh, out of all the cities, I wasn't making money. It was mm. a broken, broken model. Mm. So I went out on my own. That's a big deal that people don't realize. You can be successful inside the wrong model. Exactly. And get you nowhere. So uh, I, I had this mantra, how do I get 2,000 people in the room? How do mm. I get 2,000 people in the room? It just kept going through my head all day long. I finally got a game plan. And I, I moved to Atlanta to do my first 2,000 person event. I actually got 1,300 people and That's it was awesome. Brian Tracy and Og Mandino. Oh, wow. And then, uh, what the year was that? That was 1991. Wow. And the next event was uh, Brian Tracy and Jim Rohn. Wow. No, it was actually Og Mandino and Jim Rohn One of in the Chicago. Great I, have, I, I don't spend a lot of time in the rearview mirror <laughs> and I have very few regrets in my life. But I had a chance in 92 to see Og. And I said, now I'll see him next year. Yeah. And there was no next year. Yeah. And to this day, because uh, I've watched so many of his videos and YouTubes, I've read all his books. I've, I've probably, I don't know, I've probably sold half a million of his books. But to this day, it, it hurts me when I say it, that I didn't go. And it's, but it's also been a, a point of reference, that pain. My wife and I, we say this all the time, when in doubt, go. Exactly. Because sometimes there isn't another year. That's the number one thing I've gotten from people about Jim Rohn, mm. their biggest regret. And uh, as you know, I just did a three day with Dennis Waitley. Yeah. And I think the majority of people that came because they, they've heard me say that about Jim, mm -hmm. you know, you get those opportunities, just got to do it. Right. But um, eventually I got 2,100 people in D.C. for Jim Rohn and Og Mandino. Then my wow. next event was 2,600 people, Jim Rohn and Brian Tracy. We're talking 1993. And Jim said at that event, he said, Kyle. Uh, my business partner owes me four hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, we're breaking up. Can you just pay me directly, and I'll take it off the tab of the partnership for this next event? Huh. And I said, Jim, uh, I think you're the best speaker in the world. I'm a pretty good promoter. Uh -huh. uh, would you be open to um, me taking over? And I knew he wasn't looking for a partner, Brian. Sure. It had two partnerships that yeah. went south. And I said, so it'll be my company. I'll pay for everything and I'll just pay you off the top like a speaker's bureau okay. and I'll go create product. I'll pick up the tab and I'll pay you a royalty. And that way you always get paid regardless. Uh -huh. And at the time, Jim was doing about 20 speaking dates and $4,000. Uh -huh. And so I immediately raised his fee to 10,000, had him 110 dates that first year wow. and started creating products. And, uh, the thing about Jim was he was the gateway drug to personal development, right? <laughs> oh, my God. So um, after that first year of having him at 110 events, I'm thinking, what do I do next? Because Jim did have this relationship with the Herbalife. Right. So it was very limited on how much access I totally had. Mm -hmm. So I started another company called Your Success Store, and that's when I started booking Brian Tracy and Les Brown and Mark Victor Hansen and Nito Quibine and all these other people. Mm -hmm. People say, how did you work with all those guys? Well, my company, your success store for the next 15 years would sell their products mm -hmm. and uh, book them to speak as well. And I went on to become Dennis Waitley and other people's agent, mm -hmm. but it all began with Jim Rohn mm -hmm. and it was a handshake. And we had this handshake for 10 years mm -hmm. before we finally, I was on an airplane. I'm like, if something happened to me, what are we, <laughs> you know, Jim and I trust each other yeah. and I don't recommend 10 year handshakes, right. but that's Jim was such a, a maverick. Yeah. And we, uh, here's the beautiful thing about the handshake. It was based on bringing value. Yeah. And I knew if I brought value and he always brought value, good things would happen. Yeah. 
And so it was an amazing run. I ended up selling the companies in 2007. Right. Um, and little did, did any of us know that Jim uh, 2009 would pass away. Right. But it was the greatest honor of my life to have that time with Jim. I, I'm not going to spend all day here talking about Jim Rohn because I know you get that a lot. But our audience has also heard me advocate and articulate. Uh, I've said for many times, um, you know, outside of my father, probably the most influential man in my life. Um, and that's why, you know, by the time he came to speak at my events and this and that and the other, it was, it was kind of a surreal experience for me because he did help shape my philosophy and he really helped to this day. I, the, the guys know I recently went on a little retreat for a couple of weeks and I, I watched, uh, I, I think I watched every one of them back on the success archive, you know, for you, what was the best of what he brought to, to people and what he helped people with? What did you get most from Jim Rohn? Yeah, I. There's so many lessons I learned from Jim. Uh, the the top two or three that really come to mind. One was this obvious thing for things to get better. You have to get better. Mm. And it's so uh, almost like a cliche, but it's so true because at the time I'm 27. And, you know, I was kind of blaming the government. I was mm -hmm. kind of blaming the economy. Mm -hmm. I, I was paying attention to what was on the news, thinking that was going to impact me mm -hmm. and not really understanding that Jim Rohn said, hey, that happens to all of us. But 10 years from now, two people have gone two totally different directions. Same presidents, yeah. same economy, same oftentimes same family. Yeah. And uh, so that was a big one. Uh, the other big one was that success is predictable. Mm. And he taught me to be a farmer. He taught me, you know, not to go hunt, mm. but to farm. And that the true compounding effect comes when you sow into things that will compound over time. Mm -hmm. And that, as Jim would so you know, eloquently say, you can't create a vineyard in three months. You right. know, beware of the person <laughs> that says, hey, you plant the tomato seed, tomorrow you'll have tomatoes. Right. You know, we have this special crop. And I always call myself a principle-based marketer. Mm -hmm. And I am so turned off by all the get-rich-quick stuff. And Jim really taught the principle. And right. so I caught the path. And I thought, if I do the right things, over a period of time, good things will happen. I don't have right. to do the shortcut. Right. And the law of the harvest, you yes. know, reaping and sowing, you know, those guys. And that's why I think the message is held up. I mean, why people are like, what do you listen to now, Brian? Well, I, I listen to everything that's out there now, but I have a hard time with most of it. I do, because so much of it is technique or a, a little bit of dishwater psychology. <laughs> you know, it's, and doesn't mean it doesn't have some benefit, but it's, you know, eating dessert can have benefit, but just you can't live on it. Right. And Jim's stuff was principle based. And the principles, you know, the, the Ten Commandments are kind of old, about 7,000 years <laughs> old. They're still a pretty good idea not to kill your neighbor, you know. Well, and, and on that point, I always say there's tactics and principles. Right. And the tactics to fill a seminar room in 1993 are different than in 2000. For sure. That are different in 2010, that are different in 2021. Right. But the principles are identical. Yeah. I could name 12 principles yep. and they haven't changed at all. Right. And so I believe in tactics. You don't build a million plus lists. You don't fill up huge rooms yeah. without being tactical. But the principles are what compound. The principles are what are yeah. scalable. Right. And so Jim it was always my compass mm -hmm. about being a principle based marketer, sure. a principle based business guy. Well, that's why today, you know, how many people right now are, you know, more so than ever before. I, I, so when I went back to listen to Jim's stuff, it struck me how much of that I realized, hang on a second here, because of social media and all the, everything's politicized. Every aspect of life is politicized now because politicizing is, you know, manipulating a message for power. And, and when Jim said, hey, OK, let's say the Democrats are right. Let's say the Republicans are right. Let's say whatever. The bottom line is, what does that do for you? Right. What does that do? Like, not much, <laughs> right? Uh, right? The Republicans are office. What's that do for you? Not much, right? The Democrats are in power. What's going to do? Not much. And you, you say, you go, you know, he's right. It isn't going to change my life that much. And so, you know, I had this conversation recently, and, you know, the, the topics are a lot edgier now, and they're racial, and it's cultural, and it's this, and it's that. And I go, okay, so let's say that's all true. What's that do for you? What, what does it do for you? Not much. And so where's your personal philosophy? What are you going to do? And that success is predictable. And there are time-tested principles that if you follow the game plan, they will lead you there. Compounding is still in effect today like it was 100 years ago. The law of the harvest, 
same today as it was thousands of years ago. There are just principles that are true that work. And if you'll take the time to pursue them and learn them and apply them, you get there. Right. A hundred percent. So Jim passes away, but you, you've worked with an awful lot of people. I mean, I, I mean, Darren Hardy, Les Brown, you know, Mark Victor Hansen, uh, Phil Colin, uh, Lisa Haysha, you know, I, I give you a hundred. What, what has it been like working with all of these different people that are household names to many, but you have seen a different side of everybody in, in this business world. You've been the guy that's made it all happen. Well, I think, you know, again, a Jim Rohn ism, mm -hmm. he said, if you want to be successful, learn to bring value to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You want to be wealthy, learn to be valuable to valuable people. Mm. And so for me, Brian, everything gets down to a value proposition. If I can, if I can bring value to a relationship and vice versa, then we can go do something. And so, you know, working with Darren or Dennis or Les, there's always been a value proposition. Mm. And you have been so phenomenal at creating platforms, right? Your podcast is a platform. Mm. Your events are a platform. And I think I caught the pass from Jim about how do you bring value? Mm -hmm. And so I've always been a platform builder. When you do events, you're creating a platform mm -hmm. that helps get, you know, serve an audience. Hey, I'm going to give an audience access to Jim Rohn. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to give Jim Rohn access to an audience that wants to hear from him. And so I think I've been good at trying to figure out how can you create platforms that serve the two worlds that I like to connect. Mm -hmm. I have a quote. We just did a tour of the facilities here and uh, on my wall, and it's from P.T. Barnum. And it says, without promotion, the worst thing in the world happens. Nothing. A lot of people struggle with this. A lot of people abdicate and outsource promotion and are very disappointed with what they end up with. Uh, you're one of the great promoters. Uh, what are some of your key principles and ideas on, on promotion? Yeah, I think... First of all, you want to be authentic, right? Mm. And so I think people think, as you said, they abdicate thinking that I always say uh, marketing is not about being clever. It's not about being manipulative. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting the dots. So how do I connect the dots between what I'm really good at with my audience? Well, who knows your audience better than you, mm -hmm. right? So some people say, okay, you go figure it out, but they hire people that have no clue what the real heartstrings are. And you and I were talking earlier about you have a real empathy uh -huh. for who your customer is. So I believe uh, the business owner should always be the architect of their marketing. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean they do all the sausage making. Sure. But Darren Hardy is the architect. Uh -huh. When I talked to Darren uh, recently, he said, I got three jobs, create content, deliver content, and I'm the head of marketing. Uh -huh. Now he's not in the sausage making. Right. But uh, same thing with John Asaraf. Uh -huh. And so that's a common thing when uh, I, I know I'm, you know, uh, entrepreneurs will come to me and they want to outsource the marketing. I'm like, no, that's this really doesn't work that way. It's going to have to have your involvement. Uh -huh. You have to have a pulse. And I see oftentimes entrepreneurs want to read dashboards, uh -huh. but they're not in touch right? They lose touch with the heartbeat. And that's why building communities are so important, uh -huh. right? Having that interaction. So you see successful CEOs who stay in touch with their team, uh -huh. because by the way, our team is also our customer, of course. right? Yep. That's huge. Uh, so I think that's a big part of it is connecting the dots. There is no cookie cutter, easy answer. You got to figure out the equation, figure out what, you know, how do I get my a message and my services to a prospect or a customer in the most, you know, successful, succinct way. Mm -hmm. And that gets down to who the competition is. That gets down to the marketplace. Your that, value. I mean, you talked value. about value. I mean, it's, a, you know, understanding your value in an authentic way. Right. And then bringing that to the marketplace in such a way that you understand the need of your customer. Right. It's like, okay, I have value and you have a need. And now I need to promote this in as many channels as I can to find you. Because I really am, am passionate about, you know, I, uh, the great lie of sales. I mean, somebody said to me, oh, they were, was at an event. And they, man, you could sell ice to an Eskimo. And I went, boy, did you miss me? I, no, I couldn't. I, I, I have never been able to sell, uh, sell something I didn't believe in. Right. I, why would I sell ice to an Eskimo? They don't need it. <laughs> right? 
So what you're talking about is manipulative sales. What you're talking about is a transactional right. business. What you're talking about is taking something out of somebody's wallet and not giving them value in return. I go, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. But when I find something I believe in it, Katie, bar the door. I'm going to promote it. When I know that this has helped people just like you in your set of circumstances, I'm all in. And I'm, my job then is to relentlessly pursue to find as many people as I can with that same problem. And that the value that I'm bringing to the table is going to, is going to solve that problem for you. It's going to make your life better. Impact and improve the lives of people is our mission. A thousand percent. And so that's, it's the passion of that. And with that comes scoreboards. With that comes results. With that comes income. With that comes all these other things. Uh, and you can judge all those things as the way you want. And I think that's why it's so important to know what your goals are, what mm -hmm. your purpose is, right? Because mm -hmm. I tell people, even if you check all these other boxes, if it's not in alignment, in fact, mm -hmm. I always say, ask yourself, if everything I'm wanting to do happened, would that take me where I really want to go, mm -hmm. right? That's the other mistake. Some people, out of desperation or whatever it is, go down a path to get a result mm -hmm. versus going down a path that will take them where they truly want to go, which mm -hmm. does take a little time of reflection and knowledge and mm -hmm. setting goals. So always my encouragement is here's a good centering question. Three years from now, if I could be known as a world-class expert, what would I want it to be? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and you can relate to this we're we got a lot of things we're pretty good at, mm -hmm. right? And so forcing yourself to say, what is the one thing mm. helps us sometimes walk away from some other things that are phenomenal opportunities, right. but it helps recenter us. And so I think um, that's a huge part of marketing is knowing what your purpose is, yeah. what your goals are, and then just connect the dots. The, uh, another quote you'll see on my wall inside is from Warren Buffett. And it says, what separates the successful from the really successful is that the really successful say no to almost everything. Yes. And, and you have to have a clear set of ideas and values of what you want to do. And that's why it's worth the time to take the time to grind it out, to grind it out. Because once you're up and running and once you're selling, now you're serving. Yeah. And um, better to serve the ideal than serve the nightmare, you know? And it takes some sophistication to get there, right? Mm -hmm. I think the older we get, mm -hmm. the more we figure out the things that are easy to say no to, yeah, right? right? And uh, you... We, you you have to kind of go through it all. I'm always impressed with people early on that are so crystal clear right. and they can say no. Uh, but it, it is so true. I, I am definitely a no guy. I'm not a yes guy. Right. It, it's like find the one or two things that can knock down. In fact, that's the other part of marketing is what one thing can knock down all the other dominoes mm. and find that one thing. And it's part of the wheel we talk about. There's mm -hmm. five things to pick out a spoke and one of them is what's going to be the most strategic thing that will take you the furthest sure conversation we're having because as as uh you guys know i'm an entrepreneur uh, kyle's an entrepreneur and kyle is actually in town just did an event with uh, dennis whaley right here in rancho santa fe 88 year old dynamo uh who just blew up a a, a room of incredibly influential people and i also asked my kyle to get together to meet because I have a business venture that I'm, I've been working on for some time, and I'm reaching out to you because, hey, I want your input, I want your wisdom, and uh, see if we can do some stuff together. So you guys are listening to someone that I listen to when I'm growing a business here today. Um, I have in front of me something that's kind of neat. You put together this little book, and I'm, I'm excited to let folks know how they can get their hands on a free copy of this thing, which is brilliant. And it's called Success Habits of Super Achievers. Talk to me about this project, and uh, this is really the combination of all these people you'd met, all the folks you'd been behind the curtain for, and you said, okay, I want to get together and find out what makes you guys tick, what your best advice is, and you put it all together in one place. Yeah, so uh, the majority of these came from my podcast and uh, longtime friends. My podcast, uh, Success Habits Podcast, is based on people I've had a long-time relationship with. And Brian, I have taken for granted, I have access to... Darren and Brian and you and Jim Rohn and uh, I would have these little masterminds where Mark Victor Hansen would come or mm -hmm. Phil Collin to Def Leppard and people say, wow, I got this amazing access through you, Kyle. So when I started my podcast, which I reluctantly did because I took it very seriously, mm -hmm. I knew once you press start, you got to go right. and there was no looking back. And I'm excited that you're going to be on the podcast here yes, soon. I, um, 
you know, I would interview Darren and I did a long form podcast because I'm thinking this is really for the people that want that behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I have a relationship. So it was Darren Hardy and, you know, his house and Brian Tracy and Les Brown and Todd Stoudemire, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, baseball player, 15 year baseball player I coached. And so it's a combination of their lessons and their stories and their habits. And I'm really proud of it. It it was a long time. Well, I had no idea Phil Collin of Def Leppard was such a deep thinker, right? Because you think of Def Leppard, you're thinking, uh, you know, heavy music and this, and it's a guy, this guy is cerebral. He's got so much on the ball. I mean, he's phenomenal. You know, I don't say someone's world-class easily. Yeah. He's world-class at three things. I don't know if you've seen a photo of him. He is freaking healthy yeah (laughs) uh he's hadn't had a drink in 32 years he's been vegan for eight years but you know he's got a six-pack and he's 64 wow he's world-class at music he he writes like we did a two-hour podcast and he writes a lot of their songs uh i've been to his house and uh i didn't know but charlie cook of the sex pistols was there there and they have a (laughs) a separate band that they (laughs) called man rays and and he's also world class at personal development. Mm. And that's really how I met him in 2012. He reached out to me and he had become a Jim Rohn fan. Mm. And so we filmed for three days a thing called Rockstar Fitness. But amazing human being. Mm. And great insights. And again, like I say, you, uh, so t- talk to me a bit about the book itself and some of the, some of the magic inside here. Well, you know, I, I did a thing called uh, 52 Lessons as well. And some mm. of these lessons are in here as well. So I think of uh, Brian Tracy, 1991, I'm at this young seminar promoter. And I mentioned I was promoting Brian. And he invited me to his house when I was in town. And he, he said, Kyle, you know, you're, you know, you're 29. You don't have kids yet. He said, I really want to encourage you to pay the price for the next two or three years. He compared it to an airplane, getting a plane off the oh. ground. He said, you go down the runway 80 miles an hour and you're burning up massive amounts of fuel, but the plane never goes off. You know, it's not until you're 300 or 30,000 feet in the air that now you're going right. so fast, but burning less fuel. And he says, so I encourage you to pay that price. Mm-hmm. And I did. And that was incredible advice. Mm-hmm. And Mark Victor Hansen in 1994 telling me, hey, Kyle, we're going to sell 100 million chicken soup books. <laughs> and I told him he was crazy. I'm like, Mark, you're always exaggerating, you know. <laughs> Dude, if you sell 10 million, yeah. I'll be blown away. Right. And they went on to sell 600 million. Right. And so I call that stretching the rubber band. Mm-hmm. Mark stretched the rubber band mm-hmm. of my thinking and possibilities. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you need to get around big thinkers like Brian Buffini, right? <laughs> Brian Buffini uh, you know, you've so stretched the rubber band of my thinking. And so, yeah, you know, Dennis Waitley, uh, prime time is the main time he'd written 18 number one best-selling books, mm-hmm. but he said, my day job was a speaker. So I wrote my books at night, mm-hmm. you know, during most people's prime time TV right. is when I wrote my 18 books over 20 years. Wow. Same as Ogmandina. Yeah. Same as Ogmandina. It's great stuff. Well, you have been so kind, and we are excited because we have a, a growth audience. We have an audience that loves a, a lot of good books, and um, you're making this available to people. You have a free version of this, a digital version of this. Right. And so um, one of the neat things we said is, you know, you do this a little different, which is kind of cool, is you want people to send you an, an email right. to info at Kyle Wilson, K-Y-L-E Wilson dot com. And... Um, you're going to ask them a couple of questions. Well, no, they, they just put success habits in the okay, subject. Great. And if they want to tell me a Brian Buffini story, Fair since enough. they heard it on, on your podcast, yeah. share, share it with me and I'll, I'll send it to Brian, yeah. right? If Brian's changed your life or if you're a Jim Rohn fan, I'd yeah. love to hear that too. Sure. A lot of you out there will probably have received from me in the past, the treasury of quotes from Jim Rohn. And uh, Kyle is the one who put that together. And I was, I was actually thinking about it here. I was adding it up, but I'm, I guarantee I've gave away at least 150,000 of these over wow. the speak doll over the years. Wow. And we used to buy them in giant big cases. You know what? And I taught from it. It's brilliant, brilliant stuff. Can I tell you the story Wisdom. behind it? Yeah, do, do. Yeah. So 1993, Jim and I did our handshake. Yeah. And so I started thinking, how do I get, you know, Jim's message out? I have a thing called the wheel and it's a circle with a hub and spokes. And. 
part of it is what's Jim's secret sauce? What made Jim different than anyone else? What's Jim different than Brian Tracy or Zig? And I thought of all these quotes. Now, Jim didn't have a list of quotes, right? Mm-hmm. There wasn't like the sheet of quotes. So I went through all his seminars and he had a book and he had an audio series and I came up with almost a thousand quotes. Mm. That's how prolific Jim Rome was. Mm. And I thought, okay, I'll do a hard bound with 365 quotes. Mm-hmm. But the real magic is this little quote booklet. And I envisioned a folder that you open up, a, like if I sent it to book him for corporate and in the little sleeve would be the little quote book and then mm-hmm. pull it out and it would make... Uh, It'd be really special. And I had a to and from. And then I thought the other thing about Jim Rohn, back to his secret sauce, was his advocates loved him. Mm -hmm. And so this would make a great gift, Mm -hmm. which, by the way, is a lesson. You got to empower your advocates. Mm -hmm. You got to make it easy. Right. right? You can't make it make them work too hard to help share your message. And you're the master at that. Right. Mm -hmm. With with real estate agents. Uh, and so, yeah, from that concept, I created the little quote book. So that's got 110 quotes. The hardbound had a, uh, 365. Yeah, I remember that. How many of those do you think you guys Six, made? I, I know how many. Six million. Wow. And then I did one for Zig and Brian and Dennis and Mark Victor Hansen. And all combined, those sold two million. Wow. Which goes back to authentically, this was Jim Rohn. Mm. The quotes, that yeah. was his secret sauce. Yeah, so sure his was. just kind of did better, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what we all identify with him. It's a beautiful thing. Let me ask you this. You've, um, I think sometimes we can learn as much from the mistakes as we can from the wins. So many people have come to you. So many entrepreneurs have come to you. So I've got this great idea. Or there's this great speaker. There's this charismatic character. They've got great content, whatever else. <clears throat> what are the biggest mistakes you've seen people make in trying to make a business go? Uh. <clears throat> Depends what kind of business, sure. right? But I am a big believer and you're really good at what you're wanting to go do. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think one mistake is they, they get confused about an idea and actually it being what they're good at mm. and their ability to go sell it. Uh, ideas aren't worth that much at the end of the day, mm-hmm. right? Uh, I think oftentimes in this digital world, people have an idea, but they don't have an audience Mm -hmm. and you have to build an audience. They go hand in hand. And again, I'm not a big believer in trying to convert cold traffic. So I I like to fish versus hunt. We talked about farming, but also uh, in marketing, I like to fish. Mm. So I want to attract the people that really want what I have. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people go after cold traffic and they don't understand how hard that is to convert first. Mm -hmm. And second of all, those are going to be your problems too. So uh, the wheel is all about attracting them, building a relationship and not having too much of an agenda. And as you build a relationship, then people say yes. Mm-hmm. So going back to the question, it's, it's a, a lack of patience. Mm. It's wanting the instant yep. result. Yep. Um, most of my business comes down the road. Mm-hmm. Rarely is it just immediate. Right. It's, but that's the best kind of business because they're sold by the time they get to you, right? Right. And so what happens is you have to weather your immediate need for the opportunity to come. And it, we talked about it. I go, you know, we're, we're launching this new entity here and I, I'm a pretty rapid guy. I like to get things done quickly. I've, I've, and, and you know, it's like, so, okay, you can go fast or you can go far or you can go deep. Well, which one do you want or which two do you want? <laughs> right. It's hard to do all three. And so I think um, it has to be something, you know, the word passion, oh, I want a passion and purpose and all the young kids I, I see, you know, my, my kids are all in college and I meet these kids. I want to live a life of passion. I go, do you know what, the, know what that means? Like the word passion, it comes from the, the Greek word paseo, which means to suffer. Mm. What are you willing to suffer for? Mm. And, and the truth is most people aren't willing to suffer for anything. No. I want the results. I want the outcome. I want the money. I want the sale. I want the adulation. I want the, you know, people would come up to me all the time. I'm sure you heard this. People go, I want to be a speaker. Just like you. <laughs> I want to be a speaker. I want to be in front of thousands of people. I, I want to have the impact. You hold the audience in your hand. And I go, do you really? Do you know what you're asking? Do you know how many hundreds of nights I spent in a crappy hotel in a town I didn't want to be in? I was motivated by the purpose. I wanted to reach the one person. You know how much challenge and strain that put on my family, on my health. You know what it required. You know what it took for me. I bought an airplane so I could be in two cities all the time in the same day. Uh, you know, that, is that what you want? 
No, oh, no, no. You, you want the adulation. <laughs> you want the money. You want to have the impact, but you got to pay a price. And so passion is what are you willing to suffer for? Right. And uh, you got to be willing to strap it on and, and take a few hits and take it on the chin. And again, that doesn't sell a lot of books, does it? Okay. It, no. it doesn't, doesn't motivate people in the short term. Yeah. When I would fill up rooms, that's the number one question people would come up to me and ask mm -hmm. when they were the, when they found out I'm the guy behind mm -hmm. it that filled the room up, mm -hmm. they're like, and it didn't matter. They could be a doctor, they, whatever. Yeah. They're like, how do I do what Jim Rohn's doing? Yeah. And that was always my answer. Go find out a way to become, and what I would say back then is a millionaire doing what you're really great at right. until people want to pay you for you to teach them. Okay. I am not a believer and go do a lot of research and learn about something and then go sell that. Now, yeah. some people teach that. And that's sure okay. I know they do. And, and you can get short term results with it, too, but it won't sustain because there's no stake. Yeah, there's no stake. And, and it's not going to ever impress me. I want, I love entrepreneurs. That's yep. one of the reasons I love you and love everything you've built and done. And entrepreneurs at the end of the day are serving people and bringing value. Yeah. And then they earn the right. Like the speakers I'm really attracted to had become successful in something yep. and they've earned the right and their stories aren't regurgitated lessons they learn from reading a book they're right. real lessons and uh i delivered a book to you from kevin eastman yeah. uh nba coach who won a championship and you know when you've been a head coach for 40 years and your boss is a, a billionaire and your players make hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. and you have fans and you go through that for numbers of years you have endless stories right. from your own experiences right Right. Right. The pressure. That's the why it's a book I'm looking forward to reading. Yeah. And, and it's, it's powerful. And that's what I yeah. gravitate to, yeah. towards. So no doubt, no doubt. I mean, and it's, it's the real deal. And you know, here's the thing, uh, as we, I got a few questions I want to ask you that I ask every guest. Jim Rohn was brilliant, but if Jim Rohn hadn't have met Kyle Wilson, there's a whole bunch of people would not have been exposed to that brilliance. Jim Rohn impacted a lot of people's lives. But if he hadn't met Kyle Wilson, he would have impacted a fraction of the lives that he impacted. Uh, and I've known that about you for a long time. And you've always, because you're a behind the scenes, you're not a self promoter. You're a gifted promoter and a, and a businessman and entrepreneur. But you've always known that I've seen you and I've seen you for who you are. And that's why I love it, because you've, you've helped reach so many people. And that's why I encourage people. You might have the greatest service. You might have the greatest heart for your customers. But if you don't promote, it doesn't matter. If, if you build it, they won't come. You got to build it and now you got to promote it so they come. And Jim Rohn was every bit as profound. He had all these quotes. Uh, he would have had all this impact, but he would have had it with very few people. And so I thank you for that. Because I don't know if it was because of your work or whatever else that I got exposed to it. And that stuff changed my life and impacted me along with many other pieces to the puzzle. So. I want to thank you for that and bless you for, no, your, for you. your work. I have five rapid fire questions okay. I ask everyone who comes on the podcast. No one knows they're coming or what they are. And, uh, but it's a, a little insight into who Kyle Wilson is. So number one, what's the single best piece of advice you've ever gotten? Okay. Uh, I think it's more currently and it's to just be happy and to, I, I, I have that type a promoter in me. Mm-hmm. So now I go slower in the mornings. I journal, I pray, I breathe. I'll mm -hmm. spend an hour or two out in nature mm -hmm. and that's non-negotiable for me. And I think um, that has been, I don't take meds of any kind mm -hmm. and it's because I think I give myself that time. Nice. The divine therapy as they yes, say. Yes. Good stuff. What one talent or gift do you wish you possessed that you currently don't? Maybe it would be to be a speaker. You know, I'm, I'm a marketer. I'm a marketer. Well, you got your podcast. Now tell everybody about your podcast well, real quick. Well, let me say this. Uh, I'm Charlie Tremendous Jones used to tell me this. Mm -hmm. He said, Kyle, you and I are the only two promoters that promote everyone else's stuff. Yeah. And uh, I didn't even get on stage. I didn't introduce Jim. I would hire people. And yeah. I did big events where I'd have Brian and Dennis and Zig and Jim. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mm -hmm. think. There's part of me that, that uh, I would benefit from that. 
Yeah, my podcast, Success Habits Podcast, again, is just going back and introducing people to the people that have impacted my life. That's mm-hmm. why I'm so excited about having you on mm-hmm. uh, here soon. And, uh, but no, that's a passion project. That's great. There it is. What book has been most instrumental in your life? That's a tough one because uh, Thinking Grow Rich was powerful. The Magic of Thinking Big was powerful. Mm -hmm. Jim Rohn's Five Major Pieces, obviously the Bible. So I don't think I have one book. Okay. Well, that was a few good ones, and our audience is pretty (laughs) familiar with all of those. Uh, what one movie do you just watch over and over again? Every time it's on, you stop. What's the one? My that's just- favorite all time movie is Groundhog Day. <laughs> and if someone doesn't resonate with that, they don't, they didn't watch the same movie I did. Yeah. Can I tell you about the movie? Go for it. Love it. Yeah. So Groundhog Day, uh, Bill Murray, unhappy, uh, keeps reliving the same day. And, uh, so he's going to manipulate the system. This mm-hmm. is so in alignment with what we've talked about today. So he does all the right things to get the girl, mm-hmm. but for the wrong reasons. Right. And every time he's almost there and then she slaps him. And when he can't get what he really wants, cause he's doing it for the wrong reasons. He then goes into a deep depression mm-hmm. until finally one day he's, he hears what she's saying and he then goes out and he does two things. He starts serving people and starts personal development mm-hmm. and eventually he gets the girl. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's a great lesson of, uh, it's almost like the salvation message yeah. in many ways. Right. It's, uh, that's awesome. I mean, it's actually the culmination of all personal growth and development because you can listen to all this stuff and you can do like the stuff we teach, you can do all the techniques and, but if your heart's not in the right spot, you know, and at the end of the day, when you get your eyes off yourself and onto somebody else and you serve and in serving people, it will expose the gaps that you have, which then forces you to go and learn and grow to fill those gaps. And then it's who you become. And it's Love Jim it. Rohn said to me, I mean, here's the truth of the matter. I went and I stood in line and I had never stood in line. I, you know, personal growth was not really popular in Ireland when I was growing up. I stood in line to meet him and have him sign my book. And he heard me talking to someone else because you Irish and I, yeah, and I, and we got into a little Irish thing. And he said something to me that he had been riffing and Joe, you know, seminar speakers, as you know, sometimes get stuck in their riffs. Mm-hmm. And he said something to me that he'd said on stage. And he goes, Mr. Buffini, you need to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to become it. And it was just because he looked me in the eye of a person I respected. And it was, it was, it went through me like a knife to the heart. And I remember where I was and down the San Diego convention center and it just, and, and it hit me like a thunderbolt. And, you know, it's interesting. My first program I bought of his was how to create a uh, cultivate an unshakable character okay. because I thought, all right, well, if he's telling me I need to become someone that I'm a, a fuller development of who I am, I went to work on my character first. Mm. And so that was the program that I purchased. And then I got them all and how to have your best year ever and all that stuff. But that same type of deal, you know, that, that Groundhog movie, now you're talking about it, is the ultimate personal growth and development movie. He started serving. He had to grow. And because of who he became, he attracted the girl into his life. Exactly. And that's the same with success. Yeah. That's the same with money. That's the same with happiness. That is the whole deal. Well done, sir. Well done. That's a great answer. Last one. In the past, we've always asked our guests what's on their bucket list, but I'd like to ask you a different question uh, as I move into this new season of my life. What does a good life mean to you? You know, I'm, I'm not trying to create a legacy as much as just do. I, th- I think the question I want to ask myself every day is what's God called me to do? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't want to stray to the left or to the right of that. And I'm still trying to figure out what that looks like. Mm -hmm. But every day, just say, what am I supposed to do today? Mm -hmm. And who knows where that's going to go? Because guess what? I didn't know who Jim Rohn was. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with goals sometimes, right? (laughs) People think they can predict in 10 years. I don't know what's around the corner. So I think it's just being open. Yeah. And the greatest way I can impact my kids is the life I live. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking outwardly. I'm talking authentically. Mm -hmm. So I think. It's a huge learning curve for me, Brian. Mm -hmm. I I was this type A promoter. I was honest. I was ethical. Mm -hmm. I was smart. But you're a grinder. I I did a lot of great things. Yeah. But I missed the moment. I wasn't Mm -hmm. that present Mm -hmm. to, you know, some of the more important questions. And I think 
you know, hanging out with Dennis Whaley, hanging out with people. Uh, I have some amazing people in my inner circle world that make me better. And mm-hmm. when I started it, by the way, that's why I started. I started mm-hmm. it for me. Mm-hmm. And every time when I think about it, it's never from a business model. It's always from how can I attract the best people that will make me better? Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. It's a good stuff. Well, it is a good life. And hopefully this has been a taste of the good life for people today. So just send an email uh, to info at kylewilson.com and just put in there success habits. And Kyle will get you a copy of this great book. And uh, you can also hear the Success Habits podcast, which is fantastic. And uh, I'll be on there very soon. I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be great. Thanks for joining me today. It's been a blessing. And like I said, from the heart, the work you've done has been behind the scenes and you've helped many, many, many people, many you will never get to know maybe until you get to meet them in heaven. Uh, but it's a, you've, you've blessed a lot of people through your work by bringing people who are a blessing to more and more people. And I thank you for that. Hey, it's been an honor. Thanks so much. It's good. Well, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks to all of you. We appreciate the chance to serve you. We'd love to hear from you. What do you want to hear more of? Maybe you know someone who needs to hear what we have to share and you want to share this podcast with them. So please feel free to refer this particular episode or any of the episodes we've done in the past to someone who might need it. And uh, as we finish up here today, uh, the person who helped me out of my Groundhog Day experience, my mother, Therese, who's all about value and principles and is a great promoter in her own right, is going to leave you with a little Irish blessing. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you soon. May the road rise up to meet you and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time.